John. Today's guest is Matt LaCroix, researcher and author of the book, The Stage of Time. He delves deep into the hidden history of humanity and is always at the leading edge of every archaeological discovery. What we have here today is going to blow your minds. Matt is at the forefront of a discovery that is going to change history. This is something that he has devoted his entire life to. It's the third time Matt has been on this channel. He's also done podcasts with Billy Carson right here, so you can check those right out down below. Please those of you that are fans of the channel, please leave us a review on Apple, iTunes, or Spotify. It means a whole lot. And of course, because of some of the subjects that we discuss here, we do get censored by YouTube in the mainstream. So if you want to check out our Rumble, go right down below and check that out in the description box and enjoy this podcast because there is so much here for you to learn and utilize in your everyday life that we have missed. And that is one of the greatest things that Matt has done with all of his research. Enjoy. John. People, welcome back. One of my favorite guests is here today. Many of you guys know him. I think this is his third time at least being back on the channel. We have the great Matt LaCroix. What's going on? How you doing? Hey, Will. It's awesome to be here. I love talking to you. You are absolutely one of my favorite people. And I love what you're doing with your whole life, right? With this profession and career. That's incredible. But yet you're just you love to delve into mysteries and into the unknown. And I love that because that's in the end we're we're delving into these passions and these things that drive us. And I and I, I commend you for that, my friend. Thank you very much. I do love it. It is funny. Sometimes I do end up in places where people are confused to see me, you know, <laughs> right? they're like, isn't that right. the guy with the ball? But in any case, listen, you've got something very interesting for us today. Uh, delving into, like you said, ancient history, ancient understanding, where we truly come from. It's, it's, it's fascinating for everybody, I think, but even more fascinating when there are new revelations. And I think that's where you're taking us today. So I'm not going to even try to preface it. Why don't you just kick us off with what's going on and where uh, we're about to head? Sure. So for, for those who are watching this presentation, um, this is not going to be the same thing that you've seen. I have a lot of new images, uh, new information, some pretty cool new stuff in this for those who have already watched it. And for those who haven't, if you want a more expansive uh, understanding of this information, please check out my work with uh, much more comprehensive presentations, like two hours plus on this. So this is going to be a more condensed version of that with some new stuff added and a more broad understanding to connect with a lot of these um, questions that Will has and his, his curiosities behind this and how it delves into our ancient world. But uh, Will, I just want to say that from someone like you that's like me, who is extremely interested in our origins and our past, you know, what is our story? How far back does it go? Is our story m much more of an epic than we've been told, right? This rather than a gradual rise of some sort of, you know, somewhat primitive type of pre homo sapien sapien that somehow eats maybe a magic mushroom or stumbles upon something and all of a sudden it becomes like one of the most intelligent um most highly advanced beings in the universe no i don't i don't think so there's something else going on with our story here well there's something else a lot more profound going on with our story and that statement though that i just made is encapsulates the work that i'm about to share with you in these discoveries because it proves in the best way that I can see anywhere in the world, the original divine nature of the knowledge that was handed down for who we truly are and who we are truly supposed to become. And that information and that body of knowledge around spirituality, religion, our ancient origins, you know, these giant megaliths that seem to spread around the world and this entire lost chapter, this seems to be nothing more than a myth with breadcrumbs that lead to something that some people think might exist and others are not quite sure. But what we're going to bring today is the best evidence that I've seen right now that shows that there was a moment in time, Will, when there was knowledge and the totality of the highest level of sophistication you can get without being materialistic, more of a connection with the universe, with the cosmos and stars, star connections on earth and energy, that civilization reached its peak from the point that we're about to talk about today. And from that point, we also can extrapolate to understand that it also points towards specific symbols and understanding of who we truly are 
in the power that's within us that has been somewhat forgotten and I think waits, waits within our DNA and waits within the Akashic records of our mind and our connection to the universe that we are here almost at this tipping point, right? As we're transitioning from this age of age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius, that that energy is changing. It's a higher vibration. It's a higher frequency. We're moving into another time when these mysteries are being unlocked because it's time for that, for that to happen. And so that's why I'm trying to expose this in a way where I can say, look, this is so much bigger than rocks, Will. This is so much bigger than just some dusty stuff that we can uncover in some part of the world. This is the very origins of who we are and the divine nature of what we've forgotten. So let's get started. Please, 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 please. Yes. Uh, and you've already touched on so many things that I'm already, uh, as you can see me writing and scribbling like crazy, uh, because touching on the technology and what that was like. And uh, I know you're going to get into that, but that's definitely something that I want to understand. And I've always wanted to understand from ancient these, these, these communities, societies, uh, cities and places that you study clearly didn't have the obsession with materialism that we do, or if they right. did, you know, they, they balanced it some, somehow. And so I know you're going to get into it, but I'm just definitely, if we have time to, to talk about what a, a highly advanced technological society looks like that isn't obsessed with matter. Right. You know, and I, that, so. that's, that's such an important point to make will, because there are two divergent timelines that civilization can go down. There is the highly technological route that usually starts with like an industrial age. And then there's the route where it's more of an organic route connected to the energy of the earth and not needing a more materialistic society. And I like that you brought that up because the evidence that we're going to, that we're going to uncover here, and I'm about to show you shows that there was a lowering of a completely different type of civilization that had never existed before and has never existed really since. And that is what this, I think, is the underlying uh, tone that we want to lay down when we're discussing this. This is the 2017 discovery that was made in Lake Vaughan in eastern Turkey. Now, I want to give a little story behind that that I think is rather interesting for those who haven't heard this yet. But in digging into this story about these discoveries that were made in Lake Vaughan, I found out that it, an interesting tidbit to the story was that uh, archaeologists and divers from different universities and places around the world had been interested in Lake Vaughan, okay? And they had come here and they had wanted to dive down because they had suspected that there were underwater ruins based on what we're about to show in a few minutes here from a, a site just inland called Kef Kalesi. Okay, but when they were trying to dive down, they ran into a lot of opposition from Turkish archaeologists and archaeologists specifically from from Vaughan and Ankara and Istanbul, who advised them that there was nothing to find under the lake and that they were wasting their time. They dive down and they go down more than 100 feet and they discover some of, if not the most significant underwater ruins from an ancient civilization on Earth. And the reason I say that loaded statement is where else in the world can we find underwater megalithic ruins of high level of precision like we see here? The only other place that I'm aware of, which is where the parallels are going to come from, is Lake Titicaca with some of the submerged mm -hmm. things there, which the parallels there are quite incredible. So the discoveries here are new and a lot of people have never even heard of them. So, Will, uh, this is something you've seen before, and a lot of people need a little bit of a backstory to understand, but the tablets we're seeing on the screen are, this is what's called the Sumerian King List. Now, the Sumerian King List, along with many other tablets from ancient Mesopotamia, were from the original, this sort of proto-civilization that was very mysterious that existed on Earth, that we have a lot of evidence from but a lot of questions still remain for who they were and where the knowledge that was handed down to them came from. But in these tablets, which are the oldest records on earth, and we know that because paper only lasts 500 to 1,000 years, and these tablets being in clay and stone can last two, three, five thousand years or more. And in many cases, these stories were carried down by other civilizations that understood their past. But the important thing to, to know here is that this set of tablets, the Sumerian King List, as well as many others like Eridu Genesis, 
Um, and we look into myth of Adapa and this ancient world that we find uncovered through these tablets discusses how there were five original cities created on earth that were lowered down to this mysterious Sumerian civilization that came out of nowhere. Now in those tablets though, we find that the original myths and stories that later became biblical stories, like the Old Testament and New Testament and a lot of the Hebrew stories, a lot of those stories came from the Atrahasis, the Sumerian king list, the Epic of Gilgamesh, those original flood stories. And part of my body of work and my obsession for so many years has been trying to recreate this ancient story and take what once was myth and turn it into reality, but try to connect the story in a way that we can understand our entire past in our epic. But that's what is so important because at the end of the lists that we get for these cities, the last city mentioned every single time, the name of it is called Shurupak. Now, I've talked a lot about Eridu in the past, and it's time for me to pivot a little bit away from that and start talking more about Shurupak. Because Eridu, as important as it is, is doesn't give as much evidence to tie into the story that we're about to connect right now as Shurupak does. And that's what's so important about it. Um, now, Will, if you remember, Shurupak is the last of these ancient, ancient cities that existed that is mentioned in the Epic of Gilgamesh, when Gilgamesh goes to seek the secrets of immortality from Untapishtim, the Zayasudra flood figure who is the biblical version of Noah. Now, for the, for the purposes of the rest of the entire discussion with you, Will, I'm just going to refer to this person as Noah because it's much easier for people to understand. But the only time I'm going to say this is that the original name of the Noah figure was Utapishtim, or Zaya Sudra, and he was the last Sumerian king from the last of the Sumerian cities before a great catastrophe came through and destroyed the ancient world. And that is what's called the Great Deluge. But there have been more than one of these Great Deluges, and that's one of the things that I want to reiterate and explain as I go forward. But Shurupak is always discussed in every single set of these tablets as being the last of the cities. And it was originally ruled by a man named Ubara Tutu. Now, his son was Noah. And his son was the last of a set of bloodlines that connected back to these mysterious deities and gods of the Sumerian people that we believe, I believe at least, that a lot of knowledge, the knowledge that was handed down and literally the blueprints for our entire civilization came from. And in that, it's discussed how Shurupak was where this Noah figure had to create this craft to survive with his bloodlines of his family and basically survive the end of the world. But that is where a lot of my understanding of this had been stuck, Will. Now, I want to show, I want to explain something on this image for people that is absolutely fascinating. Look at the screen for a minute. And I, this is a real photo taken from the excavations of Shurupak in 1931. And I want to give a little bit of a, a tiny bit of a backstory on this because it's, it's absolutely fascinating because it truly proves in my mind, the whole story being of being linked and connected and, and the proof behind what actually happened in the past being myth versus reality. What you're seeing in front of you is around 20 or so feet of, of sediment that they're going down in, in, into in different, different levels to look for evidence of civilizations. And they called these different layers within this strata one, two, and three. And it represented three different epics of civilizations and evidence they found in these, this giant excavation of Shurupak. And I want to point that out three, not one, but three different periods in different intervals of civilizations that have existed here in history. Now, here's what's fascinating that disagrees with every single mainstream doctrine of history will is we're told that civilization is only 6,000 years old and it started more primitive and became more sophisticated as it went along in a linear way. Remember that in terms of megalithic building style and tools and um, in terms of what they left behind, like pottery and artifacts, okay? In the first layer that they're excavating, they found quite primitive tools and artifacts at the top. The clay pottery was quite simplistic without much artwork. And as they went down, they found a second layer with civilizations 
that was slightly more sophisticated, but still pretty primitive. And you, what th those two levels are, are, would be the two levels on your screen that you see the individual sort of more in the right middle side of the screen. Those are stratum one, strata one and two, the two different sides of civilizations. Now, this is where it gets fascinating, or maybe it is just for a nerd like me. But Will, after they got down below those first two layers, which is around the first 13 or so feet of soil, they hit this massive void, massive void of material. And the void went so far, it went 17 feet. And it went so far down that the archaeologist almost completely abandoned the, the digging project. In fact, some of the project members left the site. Okay, this is 1931. And it's funny, funny because so many things almost prevented them from even reaching this, like a massive sandstorm that kept them stuck in their camp for days and they almost couldn't even excavate the site. The stories are pretty incredible, but the will, the point is, they hit this layer, okay? And they called it in these papers, and I've, and I, I've read through all the papers from the archaeologists on the site. They called it the inundation layer. And they, and they speculate on whether it's actually a layer related to the biblical flood that's described in these places. But at the end of the paper, they, dis they discuss how it's just purely for hypothetical purposes and they can't, you know, don't actually support the idea, blah, 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 blah. But what they found is fascinating. As they went down, that so much of this inundation layer they found with no human re remains or evidence, 17 feet, as I said, they almost gave up. It, that they called it this inundation layer because they realized it was just purely based on mud and sediment that had piled in, okay? At the last moment, one of the head archaeologists is on the project and he digs down further. He gets down to 35 feet, 30 to 35 feet, and he finds pottery and artifacts. But not like any of the other stratum above them. The artifacts were highly advanced, highly sophisticated, far more advanced than any of the other stuff that was above it. They found pottery that was beautiful. They found artifacts, cuneiform tablets that even told the name, get the name Sharu pack on it. They found all of these things. And again, they went on to speculate on how something like, like that could be possible without actually coming out and admitting it well. But what does that tell us? It tells us that the ancient past and these stories of different civilizations living in these areas, coming and going and being confused with the same civilization, as well as these giant flood epics of disasters that have buried and almost wiped out our memory of the past, leading to a more primitive version that's come after, is all encapsulated better in, in Shurupak than perhaps any other site in the world. Because all the layers match up exactly with what basically proves that narrative. My brain is, is trying to understand why we can't, as a society, look at this. I mean, it's taking people like you and m many others, obviously, everybody knows the names of the, of the people like you in this field that have, that have devoted their lives to this. But my, I, I initially was going to ask what that 17 foot pit drop was. And then obviously that must be the great deluge or that is a catastrophic event. It's the correct? beginning is of it. it. Yeah. It's where it started. Okay. Yeah. Do you see, Will, do you see where they're standing at the bottom of the screen, the very, the very lower part of the picture? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. At That's the bottom. where the inundation layer the, the mud layer started, then they had, to, they had to go through another 12 to 15 feet plus to get down to the original Sumerians. So they had, the, 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 where they're standing is where the flood layer begins. Okay. Now, they just All imagine right. that. So, but then, then if this is the, the truth and, and there is this massive civilization that has to be, and about what time frame are we looking at at the end, at, at that point when they're digging down 15 feet? That's the thing is that that's the, this, I don't believe this is the Younger Dryas at all. And that's the okay. part of, of the timeline and our understanding that, guys, this is so difficult to wrap our heads around this, but imagine <laughs> that the civilization we're about to talk about was destroyed from the Younger Dryas. But this <clears throat> civilization, the original Sumerians, was a, an epic of disasters that's before that, another whole right. iteration. So we're over tw we're 20, 30, maybe more than fi likely more than 50,000 years ago. Because the Younger Dryas, for, to remind anybody, ended 11,600 years ago. Right. And we're very familiar with that. That's the one that gets talked about the most. And this is for other, t it's impossible according to the, the matrim. It's impossible to have a sophisticated society that old. And what was so sophisticated about them? If you 
could? What was the thing that made them this great? Yeah. Um, so when we look at the artifacts and things that come out of that came out of Sumer, we find that they had literally invented everything, and I and I mean everything. They had invented um, agriculture, which, by the way, is the building block of an entire civilization. They had invented how to irrigate and how to uh, more sophisticated than we think. They had invented how to irrigate channels to plant, but also how to clear river channels to, so they wouldn't silt up so they could be a continuous source of irrigation. So that, cause if you have a region that's somewhat arid, it means that it has a lot of sunshine. And if the s soils are fertile and you have the ability to irrigate it, then you can literally have massive abundant crops. And they realized that. Um, so they, but now not only that, they invented metallurgy, they invented um, mathematics, they invented um, brewing beer and wine. They invented um, basically animal husbandry, raising animals. Uh, the first writing, the first commerce, government. Uh, I, I mean, we could go on and on and on. Like basically everything seems to have been lowered down to this ancient Sumerian civilization that is mysterious and alien and that was just wiped out in this disaster. And then all these mysteries remained after. And the mysteries led to something though. It led to something incredible. And that's what this story is about to unfold, Will. Hmm. What are we about to see right here? Is this, or can I guess, is this, is this Ararat? Yeah. So this is Mount Ararat and this is the most sacred mountain of the ancient Armenian people. And I want to bring that up because I do want to just mention that for all of those listening is that the Armenian story is very sad. And I do want to bring that up because it's not something I've brought up before, but the ancient Arme Armenia is one of the most ancient lands on earth. And, um, what's there today and the borders are not what it used to be and the people and the places are vastly changed but it's an ancient land that has had some of the most conflict on this planet but there are remnants there that seem to link a lost story a story that ties all the way back to the sumerians now in the sumerian king list after the the, the shuru pack is destroyed and flooded the deluge comes over and buries it the Noah figure and his sons survive the event because they're warned. And in the tablets, they fracture off and they break off. Like imagine we're trying to figure a story out and we're reading it and it's completely broken where we need to understand where it goes and there are no more bits and fragments to understand it. So we are stuck. That's where, that's exactly where we were and where I was for years, years and years and years until all of this discoveries around Lake Vaughn in Eastern Turkey came into my periphery and I started to go down a rabbit hole, Will, that has taken me on a journey that I could never have imagined and is leading to, and I can make, I guess, a small announcement here, and Will is privy to this. Um, I'll, I'm not going to say a lot on this, but I will say the work that it's, we're about to talk about right here is going to be... Um, is going to be blossoming into something bigger than I've ever done before, a project of, of high significance. And I'm not going to mention all the people involved in that, but a lot of high profile people that a lot of people on here would be very excited about to know. So more information forthcoming with that, but I wanted to drop that breadcrumb. Now, this is a map that I created of the current, and I say current, location of the evidence of a lost civilization. Again, like on the first screen. I'm calling the Ararat civilization. Now, they have left behind, undoubtedly, many more ruins than this. But these are the most significant right now that have been found and that I'm at least addressing that are a part of this civilization. And what I'm about to show you, Will, is some of the connections here around the world with symb the symbology, with um, the megalithic styles, and with the bloodlines that connect to the Sumerian story is pretty, it's pretty profound. And... Um, it's getting a lot of people very excited too. So, Will, welcome to the first and most important site in, of all of them, in my opinion. And then this is one that I'm going to give a little bit more attention to and just discuss in a way where people can understand how significant it is. Welcome to Ionis Kalesi. Now, I don't want to, I, I want to start, stop saying Kalesi going forward because Kef Kalesi is, also has the word Kalesi. Isn't it interesting, Will? I want to give an example. Um, the Great Pyramid of Giza is called Khufu's Pyramid, right? Because supposedly Khufu was buried there. 
but there's no evidence Khufu ever built it or had anything to do with it, and the name that supposedly found inside was likely a forgery. So the entire name itself completely demotes and takes you away from who built it, when it was built, and what its purpose was, right? Because saying Khufu's pyramid means it's a tomb. The same thing is happening here on another, another level. There was another civilization that came thousands of years later called the Uratu civilization. Now, they were a little bit more like a warlike war -like civilization, and they did build castles and other things, and all these sites have been named castles, but none of them are castles. And that's the word Kalesi means castle, and that's why I would like to get away from using that. So I'm going to call this, simply the site is called Ionis, and the enclosure you're seeing is called the Haldi Temple, okay? And okay. as we go forward, Will, I'm going to make a very profound statement here. I believe that what I've seen at this site and what I've seen with the, the icons and the symbology here and the stonework and the ramifications for what was lowered here, this will be the most studied and most important temple in the world in the future. And I'll show you why in a second. Here we have brand new images from literally the last year or two that are showing us what is going on right now with their finishing of this uncovering of a site that literally will change the world. This is Haldi Temple as part of Ionis. And it's part of a site that has just been found as part of a 30-year project will where they knew something was big here. And they quietly started excavating and found giant megalithic walls down lower and they moved up to the top of the mountain and they started working down through and they eventually found these um, this temple. And they've been very quiet about it. Uh, but they don't exactly know what they've found. So it, to reiterate, Will, and I want you just to chime in here if it makes sense to you what you're seeing. But tell me, like, just from what I have on the screen here, does this make sense to you of having two different periods and different civilizations? Completely. Yeah, I see it. So the Ararat civilization, obviously, being the older one there, being underneath right there. And then the Uratu civilization, if I'm even getting close to not butchering that word, is right above it. Yeah. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. And so what you're seeing are students from different universities and bless their heart because they are doing a great job. But they have no idea what they've uncovered. And I know that because I've read all their journal papers. And I love though, and I, I do want to, um, I want to call out the professor that's in charge of this project, and I'm not going to try to say his name because it is hard to say, but the um, the professor that's in charge of this project is doing, they've done a phenomenal job. This this site was found completely in disarray from a catastrophe, again, like we're going to see, and they put this site back together so well that I need to just give them props because it's so beautiful that what the work they've done. So just want to say thank you to them for doing that because they want to turn this into an open air museum for the world. What do they think they're looking at? They think they're looking at the best example of the Urtu civilization. And being, and they're calling this uh, in articles in Turkey, they're calling this the mysterious room because there are no windows and doors in it. And it is made for a purpose that they've literally never seen on earth. And I'll tell you in a second, because the symbols here show that something happened here that perhaps never has happened anywhere else. And we'll get into that in a second. Here's a recreation of the incredible temple. I want you to look at the the way that they depicted the top of that temple um, with the way that the, you see the angles for the step pyramid-like design? Mm -hmm. Pay attention to that. It's important. And just all the symbols there, just the way they designed it is actually pretty interesting because they, I think they're right. This, of course, is a recreation of this incredible temple. Now, uh, and I'm building up to something greater here, Will. Now, here's Ionis Kalesi from showing you the differences of the two civilizations. Okay, now, I don't want people to be wondering why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to build this up and share it. This site, with all the other sites that I have shown here, are part of a set of sites that have linked with the exact same King's List the king's lists that have come out of here are mimicking the biblical lists and the Sumerian lists that are coming out of the, the, the tablets that are proving that the people who built these sites, right? King Hike and all of these ancient leaders that built these and left behind these cuneiform tablets that discuss it, like right here, 
the, through that gentleman, which by the way, that's the head professor on the head of the site who's done a phenomenal job. But they're praising the high precision and building of this with basically being the bloodline sons of gods. That's what this is. That's what this states. And that when you look at the king's list, they again mention that they're descendants of Noah because it says that they're descendants of Japheth which is exactly what the biblical descendants are of Noah. And we know that Noah is si simply the Sumerian figure that came from the Utapishtim Zai Sudra story. So what we're seeing here, and I'm trying to build this up in the right way because it's so complex, is, is the lowering of something that happened here after the original flood destroyed the world. Something was lowered here that had never been lowered before. Now, let me just explain as I go along here, Will. But here's another another example to show the differences in the two civilizations. And I want to point out, Will, do you see the three pillars here on either side that they then mimicked, that the Urtu civilization mimicked above it? Do you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very, very important. That is part of the symbology you're going to see echoed everywhere is this symbol of three, okay? Now, here is, um, this is a slide that I think people are going to love. I'm breaking down all five of the most important symbols at the site. Now, this is going to blow some people's minds because my understanding of this connected to both the ancient Athenian civilization, the pre-Greeks, okay, as well as the connections to Sumer and Egypt is profound here. And, and even connections to Tiwanaku, Pumapungu in South America, and Machu Picchu in other parts of the world. But what we're seeing here is, I believe, Will, the very first cross ever shown on earth in a way though that was about showing and lowering divinity now the cross is also associated with other symbols here you see the god haldi which i believe was the god enlil who is the one who descends down in the tablets to mount ararat to this noah figure and his sons to to demand and ask how any any man could have survived the flood that's what he states and then Enki descends down and says, well, I warned him so that his bloodline could descend, to, could continue into humanity because he's a descendant of me. That's where the tablets end. But all of a sudden we see something happening here, Will. But it's not what we expect. Enlil seems to be lowering knowledge here instead of Enki. I want that statement just to sit for a second with people <laughs> because I know that's going to be confusing. <sighs> We've talked so much of the polarizing aspect of these two rival Sumerian gods of en Enki and Enlil, and how Enlil has largely played this role of being this controlling, jealous god over humanity that actually ushered in this original flood that destroyed the Sumerians. They allowed it, and that's why they didn't want to warn anybody. Enki se secretly warned Noah. That's where this whole story comes from. But there, had, there was obviously, there was an agreement made on Mount Ararat where Enlil would assume a completely different role in that epic going forward. Instead of being a jealous, controlling God that can that wants to um, prevent humanity from rising up, he seems to take on the complete opposite role. And that that is something Paul Wallace and I were talking about the entire weekend when he was here, that it's really hard to accept that, but it seems to be true, is that Enlil may have been the one, Haldi, Enlil, may have been the one who lowered the golden age to humanity. Because look at what's contained here. First of all, we know that Haldi's Enlil. If you look at the descriptions of Haldi, you're going to see it's identical to Enlil, okay? Secondly, we know that the influences here went a lot of parts of the world, but specifically pre-Greece with the ancient Athenian civilization, which is where we get the same influences from Enlil with Zeus. And so we, all the characteristics are there, so that's not something that I think has holes in it because you see the griffin there as well, which is one of the most predominant symbols in the Greek culture, which, is a, it's, which by the way, will... The griffin is the eagle, eagle, lion, cross, which is their version as, as a protector. And in Egypt, their version was the sphinx because that used to remember the sphinx was a lion head. So it was their protector, wasn't really a pharaoh. So these ancient, ancient cultures believed that they would embody these, um, these symbols and these iconography um, aspects of, of nature and the elements and power to invoke like a protector of different, of different aspects of our reality. Now, this, so I want to break this down a little bit further. You see the griffin, which is a protector, okay, a guardian protector. You see the hourglass, which represents time. Then you see the sun down below as a sun temple, but then you see also another depiction of the sun above the hourglass. So breaking this down, well, 
because you see the three crosses with and with with Enlil Haldi basically showing the three the triptych three like we're about to see everywhere else. This is basically the descending of the knowledge of divinity into mankind and the very first cross. But the cross in, at this point was about ascension. And we know that because of the Kef Kalesi artifact that we'll get to in a second to prove what the cross means. But then we also see the time, the hourglass. So this, what this means, literally the guardians and lords of time and the, the protectors of balance and ascension and divinity of mankind. That's my understanding of this temple and it, it aligns with everything else we see around the world where this t this knowledge was handed down that I believe led to the creation of the lost civilizations all over Earth, including the Atlanteans, the Athenians, the Peruvians, the Bolivians, the Egyptians, Baalbek, Lebanon area where those giant megaliths seem to all come from here. An origin point from the sons of Noah that seemed to be this other iteration of civilization after the first deluge had come through. I had two questions. Uh, the first one, the similarities, obviously you, you made some similarities or that there are connections between Enlil or Haldi and Zeus. Is that correct? Yes. And are there also, I mean, because we have this dichotomy within the, the Bible as well of the gods playing, I shouldn't say gods necessarily, but there's this there's this, there's this different character. There's this uh, destroy you God. And then obviously everybody knows what happens in the New Testament. I'm not pushing into that, but in the Old Testament, we're just more related to this sort of stuff. There are these characters that uh, have that. Are these people represented still within that sort of world? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. That's an important point to make here. Remember, I gave that description of Enlil and that little point I wanted to make of how it's confusing of how Enlil could play the role as an enlightener. How is that possible, right? Well, it looks like he switched roles into in another Zodiac later in the Old Testament to be a cruel and wicked controller of mankind, potentially even influencing us to be like a war empire to fight and annihilate each other. Think about think about the contrast there. So this 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 figure starts out as being a cruel and jealous god that wants mankind to be created as almost not as a, a almost like a bit of a labor force but in like more of the physical dimension of reality that's what we're created for in his eyes and then wants to wipe us out and destroy us but then enki allows this noah and his sons to survive and then he changes roles and becomes the enlightener of the golden age like what does this mean well Look at how the, uh, look at all like the legend of Atana, these other tablets. Clearly, these Anuna have been playing these distinctive roles within the dualistic aspect of our reality, playing positive and negative roles throughout zodiacal time periods over and over again. Positive, negative, positive, negative. And that seems to be their obsession. And it seems to be what they're allowed to do. And that is why it seems to be so confusing that it goes from being a negative influence to a positive influence to a negative influence. You know what I mean? That's, that seems to be the reason behind it. Okay. And, uh, I'm also, so then, and I, and I hopefully won't take us too far off and it's good that you still have Haldi up there now, but, uh, are we to assume these are physical, purely physical? I don't want it to take you off too far on a tangent. Are these physical beings and how did that divinity dissension happen in your eyes as best you could maybe, you know, yeah. speculate. Sure. We are, first of all, what are we? I mean, are we purely physical beings? I mean, really we're like, a, we're more of a spiritual multidimensional consciousness that resides on the, pl the universal plane that exists of all knowledge, but we are incarnated into a physical being, right? Right. I think they're the same thing, except for the fact that they are far more advanced than we could ever imagine right now in our existence. And it and it's some confusion on whether or not because time isn't linear and how our understanding of reality is skewed based on a very limited basis that some believe and there are interesting correlations with the fact that they could even be us in the future somehow. Totally. And I wanted to, and even before you get to that divinity part, I don't want to skip on the time. I love to have discussions on that. And for some people who may be listening to this may not have heard or have any understanding of what nonlinear time is if they have never had any experiences with that or if they've never read anything on that. So how did these 
cultures understand time in that sense. Right. So I think it gets back to this. I mean, look, one of the primary symbols on here is time. Like to, to me, when you look at the Anuna, this figure right here is one of them. They call, they, they have this statement they always say in the tablets. They call themselves the ordainers of destinies. And they always talk about time. And they always talk about how they have moments where they have to interject something at a specific time. And how they're often considered like time lords and all these associations with them. And even the greatest Assyriologist Sumerian expert in history, in my mind, George Smith, at the end of the Chaldean account of Genesis, again, he concludes about the Anuna and, and their influences on civilization and humanity that it doesn't make any sense to look at the Anuna, the Anunnaki Anuna, other than the, through the lens of the fact that they seem to have come here to this realm at different time periods in history for very specific reasons. That's what he said. He didn't know why. I mean, he, he, he could speculate, but this is from the 1800s. And so we're looking at something I think that's far greater than a lot of people want to understand, that we're part of a story that's so much more powerful and, and so much more of a divine connection that is more like a war in heaven that's being manifested on earth. And that whatever, everything that's been happening here is about this battle over humanity reaching ascension and going through these periods of being going through war and destruction and then rising up because I believe that's as a law of correspondence and we're about to see their obsession with that and the artifact here in a second will, but they, everything was based on that for them. So it seemed to be some kind of a war over what, what we would become and what we would allow to become that seemed to be being manifested at different points here throughout history where great knowledge was lowered and we reached these states of building pyramids and temples that would align with the stars and divinity within earth and the universe itself to points where we forget everything, moments where we forget everything and who we are and then feel like we're just, we're just some kind of an, an ant that's in, in an infinite universe that doesn't matter. But it all comes back to this point where we're part of a great story that we need to remember and we need to not be afraid to, to understand and to bring into our lives because it shows the true, it truly shows the divine nature of who we are. Well, totally, totally. Yeah. Oh no, please keep going. Go ahead with the, I'm, I'm too curious now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I just spent a lot of time on that and I spent way too much time. So let me try to speed up here. That's just one site of a number of other sites, and I want to just quickly just cover them as we move through. But this is one of the sites that is um, a mirror to Ionis. It's directly across from the lake from Ionis, and I, I think they have close association to links. Now imagine two temples, opposite sides. One perhaps is, is for the uh, faces the setting of the sun in the west, and the other for the rising of the sun in the east. I believe Keth Kalesi was a temple built for the rising of the sun and Ionis was built for the setting of the sun. And the, the reason I'm bringing up Keth is number one, Will, look at this for a second. This is as bad as Eridu. Do you see any fences there? Do you see any evidence of excavations? Do you see anything at all preserving this site or studying it or anything? Nothing. No. Nothing. At all. This is basalt, one of the hardest stones on earth the remnants of an ancient temple called Kef. Again, I want to try to stop using Kalesi if I can. So call it Kef Temple, okay? Sure. And it is sitting in, the, in, in a state of literally being strewn everywhere from catastrophes, okay? And it's, and it's been hidden because they found what I consider, if Ionis is the most important temple in the world, then the artifact they found here is what I consider the most important artifact. Welcome to the Kef rock relief artifact that is um, <laughs> mind-blowing, okay? Mind-blowing to think about. Connected on Will with everything that we just saw at Ionis with the symbols. Imagine this is a cipher, a cipher that could have been transported between civilizations or at least just shown that not only contains similarities with the other symbols, but sort of is a different way to look at it. Imagine the Ionis temple is more of a temple to show where ascension was lowered down and where it's the most divine place of the of Enlil, known as why it's called Haldi Temple, for his divinity of lowering it down and being being the lords of time. Whereas this relief is basically giving you the teachings, Will, 
for all of reality itself. And I mean that. If you understand what's in this box, you will understand the keys to the universe. It's a box in and of itself, nothing inside the box. It's just understanding all of the- There's nothing inside. It's symbolic. Yeah, there's nothing inside. Yeah, obviously. Okay, okay. I didn't want to go the Ark of the Covenant route. Well, no. I mean, you know, no, seriously, go to similarities with that. Perhaps there are. Look at how that might have been carried. Just like with the same way that it, the Ark was shown, I absolutely am open to that. the theory that this may have been carried like the Ark was. For people to want to know the dimensions of this, it's like three feet by three feet by four feet. It's rather significant, the size of it. It's not tiny. It's actually quite large. Um, so again, this was found here. <laughs> this is where the story people are going to like. This was found right below this temple, but it was found in a way where, like Obekli Tepe, it was buried deliberately. It was found hidden, buried, because I believe they were trying to preserve it. Because like I said, what is contained in this box, this relief could it literally unlocks not only understanding for the law of correspondence as above so below but the teachings of the, the balance of the flower of life the balance and harmony within us how to retire states of consciousness even well look even shows haldi passing the pine cone of knowledge just and instead of a handbag he's got a cup which is the same type of symbol it's coming out of it it's like the totality of knowledge with the tree of life, with the symbols of three everywhere. <laughs> Go look at where th how three is, is shown here. You're, gonna, you're not going to believe how it's shown. Now, Will, are you ready for this? These are three within each, it's, it's each other. There's three points within it, just like we see these three um, step pyramids, mm -hmm. which is basically the triptych of divinity of knowledge, where his hat, his he helmet is pointing right to knowledge, right? Just, and again, mm -hmm. that's the evidence to prove that Enlil was passing divine knowledge, because this is what that is. I see. But, doesn't that look like the T-shaped pillars that go back to Tepe? Uh huh. Look. Yeah, yeah, the famous ones. Yeah, of course. Well, I believe they they created go back to Tepe and everything else after this point. And that this right here is why we see so many other depictions of these symbols and teachings around the world. Now that step here at the top that's inverted. I don't have every image in this presentation, but you can trace it to Madain Saleh. Um, in, in Saudi Arabia, you can trace it to um, parts of Petra, Jordan. You can trace it to Ma parts of Machu Picchu. You can trace it to Pumapunku, Tiwanaku. This symbol is like all over the world. Now I'm going to show you an example of just to, just to clear, clarify here. This is, they're both Haldi, just so everybody can see that. They're both Haldi. And in this, you can see Haldi is basically standing on the lion, the back of a lion for power and strength, which is why the griffin is his symbol later, but griffin is the lion and the eagle together, okay? And then you can see the griffin above him. That is not an eagle, it's actually a griffin. And it looks like an eagle, but it's a griffin. Above his head here. And so these are the two griffins showing protectors. So remember, protectors like in time, in Ionis, these are protectors over the path, the path of divinity within humanity. There's the flowering of consciousness to reach Kundalini in our highest states of consciousness, basically. And here are basically the left and right hemispheres, the God, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, you know, the, the body, the, the mind, and the spirit. It's always been there all along. And it's showing you the doorways of divinity right here. That's basically what it is. <laughs> Profound, right, Will? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I, I'm, I'm also curious, as always, what other people are saying that it is. And I mean, because I look at the, I look at the detractors in, in, in a certain sense to try and better understand. Thank you. That's a great and, question. I'm actually really glad yeah. you mentioned that because I forgot to talk about that. Thank you. Okay. So here is where it was found right below this site. I, this is going to be a great backstory for you, Will, because the story proves it's in the significance of what it is. This site was found along with Cavus Tepe in 1964. Whereas Ionis and Zernaki and the underwater ruins were found recently um, and by a whole other team in a totally different group. I want to point that out. The people in Ionis are awesome. The professor in there and his group are fantastic. They're not trying to hide anything. I love what they're doing. The people who, who discovered this are. That's, I want that okay. to be known. What they, did okay. is, what they did is criminal here. And I want to Let's tell see. you what they did. 
Not only is this site been looted and destroyed and left in the state after it was discovered, but they found this box right below this site buried and hidden like Gobekli Tepe. And instead of studying it and making it one of the most important artifacts in the world, because that's a basalt, to create that out of that stone is that that hard. I don't even think this was created by hand. Well, how could you create one of the hardest stones on earth? That kind of, that, that kind of, that's work. always a question, right? Yeah. I don't know. That's like laser tools it. or something. <laughs> the point is this was found and discovered in 1964. Nobody has ever even heard of it. It was then t taken to the, you ready for this? The outdoor museum at Vaughn, the museum at Vaughn, where it was left in the garden outside for 30 years. <laughs> in a garden for 30 years. <laughs> then it was moved to the Museum of Anatolia History in Ankara, where it remains in this picture, this is a current picture, where it remains in that museum, so obscure that if you go to the museum's website, it's not even listed in the itinerary of the things in the museum. Do they know? That's always going to be someone's question. If we're hiding this, do they understand what this is, what it possesses, what it could mean to humanity or just to anyone that could really get it? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely the truth. I mean, imagine Eridu. Think about the think about the echoes that are coming here for anyone who's listening to my show on Eridu, the stuff that's on Eridu. Remember, if you give a little history lesson, they discovered that in the late 18, 1800s and they find artifacts. Then they come back with the British Museum in 1946 and they're walking around taking photographs and they're finding things and they never go back ever again and the site is left in disrepair no infrastructure it's exactly like this nothing in place they find it they know how significant it is they find artifacts and they just leave it what i can conclude is they they are not allowed to destroy it there has to be some sort of an agreement there and they're not allowed to destroy that artifact either but what they can do like they did it to air do is they can simply not talk about it and just leave it to whoever else wants to do whatever they want. That seems to be this, this thread that we see going through a lot of this. Okay. Because you, I, I saw that in another presentation that you did that I, that I watched of yours, obviously that what, where was, what else was abandoned? Was it another site? In yeah. Eridu? Um, Cavus Tepe is another site in, in, as part of these sites that is absolutely incredible. That was also abandoned. And we'll get to that in just a second. But look at look at the comparisons for anyone who's not sure of this. Um, again, the, the the hat and the horns are slightly different because I don't want people to pay attention to that. The hat, the hat tends to be representing mentality. For anyone who's trying to understand, everything is about sim symbology, right? Everything is about sim being symbolic. So it's not actually a pine cone. It represents passing of knowledge. Now the hat represents what kind of knowledge he's passing, because the hat is directly tied into the knowledge above showing divinity. See that? The, the specific type of hat is a type of hat worn by a magi. For anyone who's wondering, that's like a magi hat. And so it tells you that Enlil, in this case, decided to go through a period of literally releasing the greatest knowledge into humanity, which is why we see such gigantic megaliths around the world, because he is all about power and strength, and it would make total sense. Now look at the comparisons. Here is from the, the, the famous um, 1840, 1848 discoveries at the Royal Ashurbanipal Library with this music, uh, flower, the tree of life in the center with what we find are the Anuna on either end with the, the, the priest and the king in the center. Same thing, passing the pine cone to basically create civilization. It's the same thing, see? It's the same thing. It's just in a different place at a different time. Now, here are those underwater discoveries in 2017 that I talked about in the beginning, the beginning of the show that they were told not to go down to look at, right? What's fascinating, Will, is that you can actually date mud because it's organic. You can actually go through, if you have undisturbed sediments in a lake, you can take cores like ice. And they didn't. They wanted to be kind of rather hush-hush and they wanted to discuss it, but when they found these discoveries underwater of these megaliths, they had to unfortunately um, admit that the Ur2 civilization wouldn't make sense to build there because the lake wouldn't have been low enough to build there at that time. And the, the, when the lake was low enough to build this, it would have been 15,000 years ago, making these definitively the oldest ruins on Earth will. Quickly, let's get through this. It just gets getting bigger and bigger. Look at the lower left image. This is at the northern end of the lake. All those squares... 
It's hard to see, but that entire hill, the entire thing, is a massive civilization. And they've just started excavating it. It's, it's another part of this huge civilization around the lake. Now imagine this is more like a center of commerce, okay? Imagine Zernaki Tepe is a massive center of commerce and government. And then imagine Ionis and Kef are the, the most royal temples of the civilization with Kavis Tepe being more like a royal king, um, royal kingdom area. We'll see that in a second. But here, look at the comparisons just really quick to Tambo, uh, Tambo Makai in Peru, where we see the emergence of polygonal building styles, Will. You brought up in the beginning of the show about the sophistication of building. And this stone, for those wondering, this stone is andesite. It's even harder than basalt. It's as hard as granite. It's one of the hardest stones on earth. For those wondering how they possibly could have carved any of this in there and how old it is, can we get to Cavus Tepe? We see basalt in utter perfection, Will. In perfection so beautiful that it looks like some of the cuts we see some from the Serapium um, um, and the Osirion and the, in the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid of Giza with the, the granite blocks and how they're cut. The type of style where the styles we're seeing that are emerging seem to spread all around the world from this point. There's your three pillars, just like we see Ionis will, with the Ur-2 stone that's really soft on top with a more advanced um, er era civilization underneath. Yeah, yeah, it's quite clear. I mean, there's a clear deviation from something. Either someone didn't know or, or these people really knew. It just, yeah. Now here, again, this is the site, Cavus Tepe. It is a, a literally a royal site, de descendant of Japheth, son of Noah. It's one of the sites that actually has a preserved king list that gives us direct evidence linking these sites to, to the sons of Noah. Think about that, how important that is. Cavus Tepe is the site that had had cuneiform king lists come out, mentioned that King Haik was a descendant of Japheth and that blah, blah, blah ruled here. And yet, with all that we find in this site, cuneiform inscriptions, some of the finest megalithic work in the world, and this is the state of the site today, Will. Compare this to Kef for a second. This came from one of the head travel agencies in Turkey, and they are they go all kinds of places. They're highly um, well-known there. And they were bringing some people to Kavis because they had heard about it and they wanted to see it. And this is the quote they said. From the bottom of the hill, Cavus Tepe really doesn't look like much. And confusingly, there are no signs or trails of any sort. I later learned that there is, in, in fact, no official way up or down the hill. You simply climb up wherever you like. <laughs> you imagine a site with some of the greatest secrets in history having that kind of dynamic? I've got... My brain, my brain is breaking in so many ways because does this mean that they've already taken what is significant and they just don't give a shit anymore about what's there? Or like, why is it like that? Well, I can tell you that they discovered this, this site, Kevis Tepe and Kef in 1964, found that artifact, found all these kings lists, found all these connections, and then abandoned everything right? Abandoned everything. Didn't do anything with it. It wasn't even recorded. Nobody even knows about it. I would love one person to comment on this if they've ever heard of these sites discovered in like, like since that point, because I haven't. And so what does that tell us though? Well, Ionis was discovered in, well, it was started being excavated and worked on by a completely different team in 1988 or 1989. So that's quite a difference gap there showing that something completely different happened both in the government and in the archaeological community here to actually start looking into those other sites. And, and your question you brought up is great. Did they find what they needed here and they took it? Do we know what, what was, was contained at these sites besides that other rock relief? No. Would we know anything they could have taken from these sites? No. Do we, like, all those questions remain. Like, we know, only thing we know is that they're incredibly important and they would change all our, the histories we know it from not only our historical perspective, but change the origins of religion and the story of Noah and connecting all this. They knew. And because they found, we know because they found the king list in 1964 at Kavis Tepe with the connection to Japheth. They found it with the, the son of Noah. They found it and they knew. So it just means like Eridu and other places, they uh, left it to the wolves and they just abandoned it in the hopes that maybe it would 
I don't know, <laughs> maybe disappear from disappear. history. <laughs> yeah. Not have you yeah, start nosing around and, and trying to help us all figure it out. But yeah, I, I, in you, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a couple more, but you, you also mentioned the law of correspondence and it's what I find interesting across the entire thing are all those different styles and truths. Let's say the fact that all of these carry within them so much, tr- it, it, it's like there's a central tenet and core of truth. And what we see is, you know, uh, let's say a watered down version to, to us here today on that side, right? We always look at them and we think that we're so far advanced because of our material, you know, uh, our tech, technological advances in, um, with material science. Yet these things have not changed. Our stuff is going to disappear like way quicker than, than all of these things. And so I, I'm always fascinated by that. But uh, yeah, yeah. What are we looking at here? Me too. I, I it's it's to me is we're looking at remnants of a civilization that is over twenty thousand years old, and most people don't believe it exists yet. But yet, what they built is lasting the test of time, creating something like this that is over twenty thousand years old to the very origin of divinity and humanity, and it's built with such precision in the in the, some of the hardest stone in the world, and it truly lasts the test of time. That is what a civilization should hang its hat on and, and, and care about is continuing on the knowledge of what we have. That's what really matters, right? So look at look at this for a second, Will. It's just to connect it all for people who don't know. This biblical Hebrew bloodline chart from the Noah origins is well known. It's just more or less we didn't have the archaeological evidence to prove it. And this is from Genesis 10.9 that tells you the three sons. And there you have in the lower left, Japheth is assigned Europe, Turkey, Greece. It's right there. It's the, they went to different parts of the world and built everything around the world. Let's connect it just a couple more things that people don't believe it. Top right po- part of the screen, I want to just explain that this is, this is a symbol that combines, creates the South America symbol called the Jacana. The, it's the, the step pyramid that is both inverted and non-inverted. If you can put an image on here for people that I don't have on here, but throw in the giant um, temples of Medain Saleh in, in Saudi Arabia, you'll see the inverted pyramid for specifically doorways into mountains into the underworld. Showing us that you see how well the arrows above, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, mm-hmm. right? And then you see the, the yeah. inversion on everything. The tree of life represents the inverted version. It's all here. It's trying to tell us like mapping our reality. And, and then what you're seeing here in South America is to show, is I'm, I believe that Lake Titicaca, specifically Pumapunku and Tiwanaku, was a mirroring of creating the exact same civilization at Lake Vaughan with like Ionis and these other places. Um, and then one more, well, this is the last slide on the image. I want people to wrap their heads around the significance of what this is. Look at the symbols there. It's everywhere. It's everywhere in the ancient world. And this is Machu Picchu with this a, a spring, basically, the spring, the elixir of life, like the balance of life and harmony of the earth, flowing through the very top of this, the same three-stepped, look, three-stepped indentated pyramid built out of basalt and granite of some of the hardest stone in the world. This is Machu Picchu with basic brick and mortar above it. What more tells the story than that? And this literally could not be further across the world to, than Lake Vaughn at, at this location. And it just reiterates to you that there's something greater here, Will. There's something greater that connects to something that I think humanity can come together with realizing that maybe we do know what these symbols mean and maybe they mean something that's far more divine and greater than a lot of people want to admit. Something that connects to something we can come together and realize that it's about this long, this lost legacy of us reaching divinity within the cosmos and the earth and the universe in a way where we become creator gods like them. And they're leaving the blueprints left behind from an age long lost that we only remember bits and pieces from. Like a story that people read and they, they open the book and it's a dusty book and they read through and they wonder if that could be true. It really is. And our story, if you actually understand it and look at all the evidence, is really truly the most incredible epic and the greatest story ever told.